What's up guys? Welcome back to Fisher Hex. Appreciate you stopping in. This video is going to be part four in our beginner guide question series, and we're going to be talking about testing and maintaining stable water parameters. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, number one, what water parameters should I be testing and what are the recommended ranges? Now I feel that there are 10 basic water parameters every saltwater hobbyist should be testing, and only two of them really get tested during the initial cycling process, and of course the other eight should be tested either weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly, whatever works best for you and whatever you're comfortable with. So let's go ahead and get into those water parameters. Okay, the first two are going to be ammonia and nitrites. I feel that these are the only ones you need to test during the cycling process. Once the tank is established, you really should have no need to test ammonia or nitrites. The only time I would feel that testing ammonia would be beneficial is if you are adding a lot of fish at one time or you have accidentally dumped a bunch of food in the tank and you want to see if there's going to be a spike in uh, ammonia. But other than that, on a normal basis, you're not going to see ammonia show up on a test kit. And if you are, you either are overfeeding your tank or you have too many fish. So that might be a good indication if you're not sure if you're passing that threshold or not. But other than that, there's really no need to test ammonia or nitrites. Okay, the next two water parameters you should be testing are your nitrates and phosphates. Now the nitrates and phosphate levels will give you an indication of what your total nutrient levels are within the reef tank. Now why is this important? Well, as a beginner, you're going to find that you might struggle with nuisance allergies, cyanobacteria. If you ever try to put SPS in too early and you have elevated nitrates and phosphates, it most likely will turn brown and then die off. Uh, you'll find that nitrates and phosphate levels are very important and they should be kept in check early and then continue to be kept in check as you go on. Uh, nuisance allergy can really get out of control quickly and then you find yourself using other methods to try to get rid of it and then you, you know, you're just in this never-ending cycle that should have been avoided early on. So when it comes to nitrates, the recommended range is 0.2 to 0.5 parts per million and then phosphates, they want 0.03 parts per million. Now I've seen elevated and lower in both ends with both types of water parameters. You're going to have to see what works best for you, but the best bet is to keep it as low as possible. I mean, you might be reading zero and still have algae within your reef tank. The only reason why you have zero on your test kit is because the algae in the reef tank is using up the available nutrients, phosphates, and nitrates that are in the water column as a food source. So you're going to get a false reading. Just understand that keeping these two water parameters in check early on will aid you in success in the long run. Now, I know I didn't give you a lot of information on getting these two levels down, but I do have a nuisance algae video that is actually up on the beginner guide playlist. Go ahead and check that out. There's so many different ways in that video to help you lower your levels and get your tank under control. But to sum it all up, really, guys, if you're doing your weekly or biweekly 10 or 20 percent water changes with fresh RODI water as a beginner and you're not overfeeding your tank and your tank is not overstocked, then you're not going to really have an issue with these two water parameters. Just keep them in check. Test them as needed. If you see algae growing on your tank, you have excess nutrients regardless of what you're seeing on your test kit. Okay, the next three water parameters are responsible for building coral skeletal structures and growing coralline algae. They are calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. When it comes to calcium, as long as you are within 380 to 450 parts per million, you're good to go. Alkalinity, 7 to 11 dKH, which stands for degrees of carbonate hardness. And then magnesium, 1,250 to 1,350 parts per million. As you can see, there's a lot more magnesium compared to calcium and alkalinity within the water. Now, the reason for this is that the magnesium is actually used to keep the calcium and alkalinity molecules separated so they don't come together and precipitate out of the water. Now, if you've ever had huge fluctuations in pH or alkalinity or calcium throughout the day, it could be because your magnesium level is too low. So always try to keep it in the recommended ranges to prevent those two molecules from coming together and precipitating out. Okay, moving on to the last three water parameters, and they are temperature, pH, and salinity. When it comes to temperature, they recommend between 77 and 80 degrees, pH 7.8 to 8.35, and salinity 1.025 to 1.0265. Well, guys, those are the basic water parameters that I feel that every saltwater hobbyist should be testing for, regardless uh, beginner or advanced. Now, there are more water parameters when it comes to SPS coral coloration that we'll get into in a later video. I have a separate series based on SPS coral coloration that will be coming out in the next few months, so stay tuned for that. But for now, just focus on those 10. Uh, try to get within the appropriate ranges and make changes to make sure you get into those ranges. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the rest of the video. Okay, number two, now that we know what water parameters we should be testing, this question is what should I use to test those water parameters? Now there are so many different test kits out there. It's gonna be based on your budget, 
what works best for you in your current situation. I'm simply just going to answer this in a way that works best for my situation. Now when it comes to ammonia and nitrates, as I mentioned previous, I only test this during the cycling process, so I like to use a cheap test kit. Instead of buying the full API test kit, I just go ahead and buy the individual ammonia and nitrites, and then I just use it as needed. Now when it comes to nitrates and phosphates, I personally like to use the Salifer test kit. I find that it's an easy process, it doesn't take as long as the Red Sea, and I just uh, I get a, still get an accurate reading when I use it. Moving on to calcium and magnesium, I personally like to use the Red Sea. I've never tried anything else, to be honest with you, and I just I, I did it the first time a long time ago with calcium and magnesium, fell in love with it, and I haven't changed since then. Now, when it comes to alkalinity, I was using the Red Sea, but I have since moved to the Hanna Checker you know, about a year ago or so. And uh, the reason for this is I find that alkalinity is the most important water parameter when it comes to SPS coral and overall health. I find that it needs to be accurate. You need to know where you are. And having fluctuations of 2 or 3 dKH based on color, co color titration is just not acceptable. So alkalinity is always a Hanna checker for me. Now moving on to temperature and pH. I personally, once they are calibrated, I just rely on the apex. That's just kind of, I guess that's lazy, but that's how I do mine. I just use the apex for my uh, temperature and pH. And then when it comes to salinity, I always use a refractometer. And then my secondary is my apex. But just understand that the apex, when it comes to salinity, isn't uh, very accurate if you get microbubbles on the lens. So that's what I use to test my water parameters. Okay, number three, when should I start testing calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium? Now, I feel right after the cycling process is done, after you've done your big water change to get those nitrate levels down, I think that'd be a good time to test just to kind of get a base level to see where you're at. Now, I wouldn't necessarily start throwing in SPS coral right away, but um, if your levels are within the appropriate range, go ahead and, you know, if you wanted to throw in soft coral, zoanthids, uh, pulsating zini, green star polyp, stuff like that, that can tolerate some other fluctuations in water parameters, by all means, you should be good to go. But, uh, you know, testing them to see where they're at wouldn't hurt, and it's definitely good practice. Okay, number four, what do I need to do to keep my calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium in the appropriate ranges? Now, as a beginner, the only thing you need to be doing is your weekly or bi-weekly 10 or 20% water changes. That's it. There's no need to be doing anything else. You don't need to be adding calc wasser or any other two-part. Basically, as a beginner, you don't have that many uh, hard corals in the first place, so uh, you really don't need to be adding any other additives to the tank, complicating things, and potentially causing issues. Now, say you're doing a 20% water change every two weeks, and you test right before you do your water change and your water levels are still within the appropriate range but they're a little low side that's okay continue to do your water changes but say in a month because of growth or coral growth you are doing those 20 percent water changes but before you do them you test and you find that your levels are just way lower than they should be then that might be an indication that you either need to increase the amount of water changes you have or start adding something like calc wasser or two part to get the excess calcium alkalinity needs that your tank requires all right, number five, what can I do to keep stable and consistent salinity levels within my reef tank? Now, if you didn't know this, when water evaporates from your tank, you actually leave the salt behind. Now, this isn't a big deal so much for bigger reef tanks because they can deal with a lot more water being evaporated than opposed to a uh, five-gallon nano. You know, one gallon leaving a five-gallon nano due to evaporation a couple days could definitely make a big fluctuation in salinity opposed to, you know, one gallon in a 300-gallon reef. So just keep that in mind. Smaller tanks seem to be impacted by evaporation a lot quicker than bigger tanks. But the best thing you can do is either top off manually or what I recommend you use is an auto top off system that has the water level sensor. Basically what happens is the water level gets too low, it triggers the pump to kick on, which will pump in fresh RODI water into the back of the you know, all in one or into your stump of your big tank and uh, you'll be good to go with that. So uh, just keep an eye on fluctuations. Again, if you have a smaller tank, you might see a bigger impact than you would on a bigger one. All right, number six, how do I keep my tank from having big fluctuations in temperature? Now, it's really going to come down to the equipment you have. If you are using an aquarium controller like an Apex, it's pretty simple. You can go in and uh, program what you want your high and low temperatures to be, whatever fluctuation you want to be. Personally, I like to keep mine within a half a degree. And then the aquarium controller will um, go ahead and adjust that accordingly as the temperature of the tank. 
Now, if you're not using an aquarium controller, I highly recommend you spend the extra money and get yourself a high quality standalone heater because those internal thermostats, you know, if you spend $12 on a heater, you're going to get a $12 internal thermostat. Now, that thermostat could fail on the on or off position. Hopefully, it will fail on the off position. But unfortunately, a lot of times it doesn't and it stays on, which then in turn cooks your entire tank. So if you are going to use something outside an aquarium controller, spend the extra money. I know it sucks, but just spend the extra money and it wouldn't hurt to have a backup of that as well. Okay, number seven, my pH is low. How do I raise it and then maintain the new level? Before we get into this question, I just want to say that I have an entire video that goes in great detail all about pH. It's actually one of the cards that pop up during my videos. But if you can't find it, it's in the beginner guy playlist, so please check that out if you want to know more about pH. But basically, guys, to sum it up, your pH is directly impacted by your total alkalinity and the amount of CO2 that's within the water column. Now, if you have an average alkalinity of like 9.3, which a lot of people like to keep it at, you'll have, a, you'll have roughly a pH, depending on the amount of CO2, between 8.2 to 8.35. That seems to be where it stays at, depending on the amount of CO2 that's within my house. Now I find that on days where I can't open up the window or it's really nasty outside like muggy or there's a lot of moisture in the air, I tend to have a lower pH because of that. But in that video, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways you can go ahead and elevate your pH through a refugium, dosing two part at night, connecting your skimmer outside, adding an air cylinder. There's so many different things you can do to help uh, rid the tank of CO2 or excess CO2, which will allow you to have an elevated pH level. But just remember guys, if you are trying to chase pH, don't be adding, you know, buffers, pH buffers, stuff like that, especially if you're adding things that are not in equal proportion of calcium. You're just going to throw your tank off and cause more issues. So the last thing you want to do is chase pH numbers. That's You absolutely don't want to chase pH numbers. That is one of the biggest mistakes I've mentioned in another video is chasing that pH number. So if you have a consistent alkalinity level and your pH is still within that 7.8 to 8.35, leave it alone. You'll be good to go, all right? Okay, number eight, this is a three-part question that I get quite often, and that is, what do I do if my calcium, alkalinity, or magnesium levels are really high within my reef tank? What should I do to bring them down? Now, in most situations, the water changes will definitely bring the levels down, but you've got to be careful sp specifically with alkalinity. If you have huge fluctuations in alkalinity, you definitely could do a lot of damage to SPS coral. I know that a fluctuation of two to three points of DKH a day will wipe out an entire SPS tank without a doubt. Now, some people have been lucky and got away with it, and I've even seen people only have a half a degree or a half a point of uh, fluctuation on a daily basis and wipe out entire acropora colonies. So when it comes to calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, if your levels are a little high, you could always do a water change to make sure you bring those levels down, but understand that it might take a long time because you are replacing calcium, alkalinity, magnesium with the new water. So uh, you kind of have to really do a lot of water changes to bring the levels down just a little bit. I do know in my instance when I had to do this, I actually had a box of salt that brought my magnesium up to 2100 parts per million, which is ridiculous. If you don't know at that point, your snails don't work anymore. They kind of just become lethargic and eventually starve to death. Now, I noticed that my snails weren't doing what they're supposed to do, so I tested my magnesium and then basically it was it went beyond one milliliter of titration. So I was like, crap. So I, uh, you know, I tested it on that. I bought a new test kit, tried it again, because I just figured the test kit was old and it happened again. So I knew that the levels were really high. And basically um, it took two boxes, basically 600 gallons worth of water changes to bring it down from 2100 to 1350 over a course of uh, three weeks or so. But what I recommend for those of you who have LPS and SPS tanks with elevated levels, just let the tank run without dosing two part, maybe for a day, or you know, just let it run for a little while and see if the levels naturally come down just from being used up from the coral. Now, if you just have an all softy tank, obviously those calcium alkalinity are is just not going to get used up from the coral, so you're going to have to do your water changes to bring the levels down that way. Well guys, that's about it for this video. I appreciate you sticking around. There's one more thing that I wanna mention before I let you go, and that is keeping track of these water parameters. Now in the beginning, I used a notebook, wrote it down you know, on every day, every other day, whatever I did to the reef tank, I wrote in the notebook and kept that. Then I moved up to a spreadsheet, and then finally I moved to a program called aquaticlog.com. Now I have a separate playlist that is aquatic log that has all the videos on there, tutorials, free promo codes, all that kind of stuff is in that playlist. 
So go ahead and check that out. But basically, guys, this program is perfect. You can go ahead and uh, make profiles of your reef tanks. You can put in the water parameters. You can connect it to your apex, all that kind of stuff. It works great, and it helps keep things organized, which is is key to success in this hobby, trust me, especially when you get really complicated. Either way, guys, I appreciate you watching the video. If you have any questions, please put it in the comment section below or contact me directly via Facebook or email. I will get back to you. Either way, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time. Peace.